Grand Rising. My friends, welcome back. Hey, hey there, buddies. How are you guys? And if you're new, hola. The market is doing much better today. I mean, you know, just recently just started to pop off. Everything, things in the past hour or so been in the green, boy. Things are looking good. Bitcoin is at 49542 Ethereum at 3,276 Cardano at $2.85. Binance Coin at $4.94. Tether is at $1. <laughs> if that's a joke, stable coins should always be paid to uh, the would, would be the value at that time in um, space and time of one U.S. dollar, so it should always be a dollar. Uh, XRP, dollar sixteen. Dogecoin, twenty nine cents. Solana t- moved up to the eighth, top ten. Look at Solana, boy, ninety seven dollars and sixty one cents. Solana is doing super well. Twelve percent in the last day. Polkadot, Uniswap. So the DeFi coins, you know, are doing well and will continue to do well. Avalanche has been on a tear as well. See what else here? Tezos. Oh, Tezos was down. I know it was at uh, $5.60. Some, somewhere in the $5.60 something cents earlier. Now it's at $5.46, but it is up 5% in the last day. So market doing well in terms of cryptocurrencies. It is a nice beginning. I mean, you know, depends where you see the beginning and end of the week at um, it's Sunday, the beginning of the week for you or the end of the week. But let us look at what's going on. Speaking of cryptocurrencies, Jack Dorsey Square is looking to build a decentralized exchange for Bitcoin. So, you know, Jack is a Bitcoin maximus, maximalist, maximus, maximum, maximalist, same difference in Jack's eyes. He, he, like I said, he can care less even about Ethereum. So there's a division of Square called TBD. Now, is that its real name to be determined or did they just decide to leave it as that? But in there, they're planning. Jack Dorsey, one of Bitcoin's biggest advocates, is planning to build an open platform to create a decentralized exchange for Bitcoin through TBD, his new business venture, according to a tweet. Of course, he's going to tweet because he is also CEO of Twitter. A decentralized exchange or DEX is a type of cryptocurrency exchange that allows peer to peer transactions without the need for an intermediary. And that is like the Solana, like I said, the DeFi projects like Solana, uh, Uniswap, Compound, is pan, Pancake, Pancake Swap. I said Uniswap. Uniswap, Pancake Swap, Polkadot, there's so many. Big ones, big ones, big ones. And a lot of them are on Ethereum. So it appears to be they're going to create a decentralized exchange with Bitcoin as the base. And so you'll be able to trade your U.S. dollars or your German marks or your pesos, lira, whatever, any money you want, your franc. Franks, what they call it. I don't know that. I always see it spelled out. I know it's with a C. Maybe it's Franks. Euros, pounds into Bitcoin and vice versa without any intermediary. So they're trying to uh, think of it as a decentralized exchange for fiat. One that is Bitcoin native, top to bottom. I'm, I'm fine with that. He's imagine it. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Go ahead and allow that to happen. As we said, this platform will be entirely developed in public, open source, open protocol, and any wallet will be able to use. No foundation or governance model that TBD controls, permissionless or bust. So it's, it's um, 
A very good idea. We can have an, an a, so it's basically like a Coinbase or Gemini or Kraken or Binance that ran in Bitcoin that's decentralized also with fiat trading pairs. So you can trade your fiat into, uh, I'm, I'm guessing I don't know, we'll figure out how it works, but because I know, you know, <clears throat> it's going to open itself up to the governor, government regulators if it doesn't have. Know your customer, which is KYC, which means you need to know who each customer is so that people with shady organizations cannot launder money and anti-money laundering um, safeguards in there. So they'll make sure that the money you make, you're declaring for taxes because at the end of the day, they need a cut. And if you give them a cut, they don't bother you. But billionaire Bill Miller takes a plunge into GBTC with 1.5 million shares. And this is Grayscale. Billionaire fund manager Bill Miller has taken a significant position in Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, at, according to a new filing with the Security and Exchange Commission. The Miller Opportunity Trust owns 1.5 million shares of GBTC currently value. And this at the time of this was changed since then of 44 million I can do the math right now we're about 150 so i'm gonna stop doing the math on it because uh the uh well it depends with the yeah how much the um because right now the grayscale bitcoin trust is trading at a low premium compared to the price of bitcoin so if bitcoin was saying that's just for simple i'm just gonna pick simple numbers now i can you know close to it, say fifty thousand in each share of of grayscale bitcoin was one to one with bitcoin but not one to one is is like um one to a thousand so a thousand shares of grayscale is supposed to equal one bitcoin okay so if you got fifty thousand dollar bitcoin then grayscale should be fifty dollars a share and right now is is at more like forty dollars so it's actually or maybe probably like 41 42 so it's actually trading at a negative premium at like a almost a 18 20 15 20 percent discount of what bitcoin is now for the longest time it was trading at a, a positive premium for owners of grayscale meaning if when bitcoin was ten thousand dollars and um grayscale should have been ten dollars it was like 12 14 13 15 dollars it was a premium and they was getting paid off of it so it, if it switches over to an ETF, it almost will jump right back to a one-to-one -one versus a premium, negative or positive. But the grayscale management has got to do something because for the past several months, it's been running at a negative premium. So you can get cheaper Bitcoin by buying grayscale because, you know, assuming and you shouldn't assume anything. And plus, you know, not because I haven't said it. And I jump right into it and I've been tripping. I should even sit. You know, first time I went through, and I'm not going to stop this and record this again, but you know about that positivity. Go in the comment section. Write something nice about somebody who's been good to you. and you Write something nice about someone who has been good to you in this life. Send them this video and tell them to go check it out. See if they can find what you wrote about them. Uh, I was in there somewhere on grayscale, but so we'll see where we go with that. But this guy, well, I was just thinking that um, probably be smart to buy you some grayscale now because you're getting Bitcoin at a at a premium at a, at a, for you now in a sense where in the future where either the price just goes so high it either catches up or surpasses to go back to a positive premium for holders. Or it becomes the ETF and become more than one to one in terms of its, you know, value relative of a thousand to one. Then, hey, you're going to make some money, especially if you expect it to go up anyway. Here, talk about Grayscale has been battling premium issues this year, trading at a discount. So it is a good thing to see companies in their. Funds, trusts, organizations, whatever, 
buying up Bitcoin, however they can get it, even indirectly as such, by buying through the Grayscale Trust. Legislation calls on CFTC to help craft effective crypto rules. Newly submitted legislation in Congress seeks to push the Commodities Future Trading Commission to create reports to bring more clarity to digital asset markets, saying, Go over here and, and and take a look at these guys and tell them and and, 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 and report back and, and what we need to do to get money off of them. So it's not the first time they introduced these bills. They've been trying to introduce these bills. The so-called the so-called U.S. Virtual Currency Market and Regulatory Competitiveness Act of 2021. It directs the CFTC, which is the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. So we also have securities now. Commodities are all trying to get in our business. The different securities are stocks, but other products as well, where you buy them or they're sold with the expectation that they have a, a, a quote unquote backing and that by holding them, you can make money. Commodities are goods such as oil, pork, oranges that have a quote-unquote real-world equivalent that, or like property that can, um, that has value and can be traded and it's going to go up in price and, that, and so it needs to be regulated. So you got securities and commodities looking at the cryptocurrency market trying to say now, it seems that, and in, in apparently, Bitcoin has been declared a commodity. So a real-world physical asset that can go up and down in price, and because of that, can be traded and sold amongst individuals and needs to be regulated. And it's not a security where, and I got to, um, because it's, it always gets confusing every time I try to think of it and explain it to myself to even to even think to explain it to other people. But someone on that know that everybody trying to put their fingers in the pie, as you see. So it's telling the CF, the CFTC to produce a study comparing virtual currencies around the world, make recommendations how the U.S. can compete and innovate. OK. And uh, a, a virtual currency consumer protection act, of course, produced a report on price manipulation, includes recommendations to regulate. So just talks here. Meanwhile, Security and Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler has been vocal about the need for SEC oversight in crypto markets, identifying multiple crypto exchanges as security exchanges. But we want regulation because regulation also means legitimacy. So. It's a been legitimate game theory, and you see who's already in. Speaking of things that we need to be thinking of, three boosted dividend stocks to buy. Now, the important things to know is the, the title of this one, what are dividend kings and dividend aristocrats? A dividend king is a publicly traded company that has increased its shareholders' dividends every year for at least the past 50 years. These companies have a proven track record of rewarding shareholders with regular dividends. What are dividends? A dividend is a payout. So as a, if you own a stock or an asset that pays a dividend, every on a specific time period, and let's just say every three months, for the most of them, by holding that stock, you get a certain percentage of money per stock you hold. And these dividend kings have increased their shareholders' dividends every year for the past 50 years. There's companies, and there's a lot of them, and we're going to do a deep dive in dividend kings and aristocrats. Not today, but we'll talk about some, but in the next hour, just to kind of what to think about, but... Of course, look on your own, you know, now it's easy <laughs> to go look up, you know. They've been doing it for 50 years, increasing their shareholder dividends, kind of is public knowledge. So that's a dividend king and a dividend aristocrat. 
is a company in the S&P 500 index that has paid and increases base dividend every year for at least 25 years. So a lot of dividend aristocrats or, or dividend kings are also dividend aristocrats, but there are some aristocrats that are not kings because they haven't made it to 25 years yet. You know, and some some dividend kings are aristocrats because they're not in the S and P five hundred. They're in a different exchange. You know, it's all it's all made up and make believe, anyways. Like, okay, I make a, it's like Dungeons and Dragons, but people don't seem to understand that. What I mean by Dungeons and Dragons is like, you know, you have a you get some friends together and y'all agree to play a game, and somebody get to make up rules as you go along. You know, but you hope that person is going to be keep it fair. You know. I don't know how we get by thinking um, or what our thoughts are on how fair the game has been for us in this. So dividends, you get paid this money for your holding a stock like a, or a bonus for holding it. Now, you can either get that into cash or you can get it as percentages of the stock to reinvest in. And that's what you wanted. The smart thing to do is take the, any dividend paid out, you know, especially if you're younger. And by younger, I mean, you know, no within four to you know you're not gonna retire in the next five years five four to five years um you should probably be reinvesting those dividends back into you know over time so say you buy a stock one stock let's just say easy one stock and and it was gonna just use you know there's nowhere near this but i'm just using simple numbers so you understand and every three months you get a, a dividend of point one for your stock right so First one you get is, boom, you got one stock, then you get 1.1. 1 .1. The next three months you got 1.2. Or actually, um, um, 1.21. I'm not going to go all crazy. <laughs> but let's just, so first year is 1.4 is some change. And then by year two, now you're getting like 0. 0.2 because you got like two. And you know, it builds up over time. So re reinvest back into uh, purchasing the the... the the you know in stocks and saying and like these dividend kings for example um let's jump into it so they're talking about some dividend kings to look at in here or um stocks that are pay out nice dividends lamb research is a very remember i ain't your advisor lamb research is a company who makes the only company if i'm not mistaken double check who supplies the wafer fabrication equipment and services essential for producing the chips. So the wafer that everyone put their uh, silicon chips on, Lamb makes all the wafers for all the chips. You know, the chip storage, and they got to make more chips. Well, guess who got to be also making more wafers so everybody can make more chips? Lamb. And Lamb, you can invest in Lamb. Even after the semiconductor shortage is taken care of, Lamb Research should still be able to capitalize on secular trends like the rise of 5G networks, the remote work revolution, and enterprises moving operations to the cloud data centers. And also the huge machines that's going to be created for the artificial intelligence neural networks and the centers for that. The company also saw its revenue exceed $4 billion in a quarter during Q1. During the first quarter of this year, first three months of this year, for the first time in its history, another sign of a business that is firing on all cylinders at this time. Dear John Deere, everybody, we all know John. Well, when I, I'm sorry, I paused and I put my head down just because I was going to say I don't assume nothing for anybody. Maybe some people don't know who John Deere, I, as an American person, you'd imagine that most of us or, or a lot of us have seen John Deere, but. You know, hey. which is the world largest producer of farm equipment, a major supplier of construction, machinery and lawn and garden equipment. Deere recently increased its quarterly dividend payout by 17 percent to a dollar and five cents per share. And it's certainly an interesting name to watch in the industrial sector. So, you know, John Deere is a good one. And Altria Group. Now. Some people like to invest you know and that was the same way and i and i had to change because i just had to realize you know now and, and you know this is a deeper philosophical discussion but do you, can you make money off the misery of others <laughs> are you okay with that can you sleep well at night in a sense because a cheer group they invest in 
um, a lot of smokable products, oral tobacco products. Uh, owner of one of the most iconic brands, Philip Morris, have a 10% stake in Anheuser Busch uh, Brewery and Brew in Bev. So, you know, these are, do you divest any money because they have money in big oil, big pharma? You know, these are decisions an individual has to make for themselves. Uh, I personally, personally, is my personal belief. And this is not, not even so much a belief, but my personal duality is that it would be nice if I had that opportunity in life to do that, and maybe I will one day, but not having much initially in life and, and going forward, I can't hamstring myself um, unnecessarily. Now, granted, you know, there's some things I'll, I'll fight against. Like, yeah, if it was some, I think it was hurting individuals. And they, they look, you know, but the, you, in these sections, it, Illegal things I'm thinking of, and yeah, I'm not getting involved in, but you can buy this uh, stock today if you have a Fidelity account or a E Trade or Robinhood or SoFi, M1 Finance, TD Ameritrade. Uh, so, uh, Stash, probably, I don't know, the Coinbase. What 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 can I tell you to do in that regard? You know, you have to make that decision for yourself. So would you look at that? Lumber is cheap again. And I'm not sure. I think I may have mentioned not a hundred percent that the Supreme Court um struck down the C D C moratorium on uh, the uh you couldn't event, uh, evict renters during the, the coronavirus, which is going to cause some changes to the housing market. And, and so in the housing, we're going to keep an eye very closely on what that will look like. But this is fascinating to watch as well. On Friday, the cash market price of lumber fell to $389 per thousand board feet, according to data. That's down 74% from its $1,515 all-time high in May. It is a fourth cheaper to buy lumber now. And lumber was super, super expensive. The market seems to be trying to find a bottom, they said, what's going on. As lumber prices reached a, uh, a record level, people stopped buying, plus sawmills were up in production because there was so much money to be made in it, and it caused a correction. And now that the prices are coming down, everyone is kind of wait. They, you know, you don't want to catch a falling knife. What does that mean? When something is, this direction helps me think better. I don't know how it looks on there for you guys. I think it looks backwards. Let's try it this way then. If you got like a stock or something and rising in price and ups and downs, you know, as it goes along, you know, and has some stumbles and stuff, you you that's what you expect to see, right? Now, when you have a crash or, or things start to go down tremendously, you can say, oh, wow, that thing that I wanted is now on sale. Should I buy now? Should I, as it's going down in price, oh, look how it's going down. Should I buy now? It's, it's way cheaper. It's cheaper than I, you know, where I wanted to buy it at. You could, and there's no problem with dollar cost averaging where you see something that you feel is a good value for you. You know you better than anybody else. But there's a phenomenon called a falling knife where you don't try to catch a falling knife. You let it hit the bottom, bounce, and as it's, you know, stable relatively or start to come up, that's when you start to dollar cross average in because you don't know where the bottom may be. And if you try to catch a falling knife, you can get cut, basically. So lumber prices have fell a lot. People are still acting a little resistant. Some lumber yards are resistant dropping their prices because they bought so much of the wood for higher prices this summer. They don't want to take a loss on it. Uh, we will continue to keep an eye on this and also with home building. 
to occur. Final story for today and some discussion is do you need to really walk 10,000 steps? No, that answer is around 7,000 according to studies. 10,000 came from a device created back in 1965 where they just created a, 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 a pedometer, the Japanese, which just said 10,000 steps and everybody's like, oh, I guess that's the number you need. But from doing actual research and studying people and looking at mortality rates, it appears to be around maximize, optimize around 7,500 steps a day and you plateau. So shooting for 10 is good, but may, hopefully you're getting closer to that seven. You know, getting way more than 3,000 seems to be better than, um, you know, one, every 1,000 over 3,000 seem to be uh, give you the improvement. But it plateaus at around 7,000. So don't beat yourself up. That is one of the main lessons in any of this is, you know, take it a little bit easier on yourself. Push yourself, though, you know. Don't, don't, don't take it easy on yourself in a, in a sense of wallowing and, and pity. Pity is not an emotion you want to have for yourself or others. You want to have compassion for your others, compassion for yourself. But compassion can look and say, no, this person. I remember when I was younger um, and not having much and when I started to, you know, get my first job or first couple jobs at 16, had two jobs in high school, two jobs. <laughs> And, you know, wasn't it and played sports and was part of a community organization that used to meet after a while almost every night. So I it was a lot, but it was fun. But when I started to have a little bit more spending money, I would see individuals um, who, you know, appeared destitute, transient. And, and um, I would, you know, and, oh, they, you know, oh, give them some money here, give them some money. I felt good about it. Years later, um, got a, a lot of training went through, was in a job with her, a lot of hands-on training where worked with a lot of people who uh, you know, were part of that, that group of society that were the have a nots. The, 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 the individuals brought in by police, the individuals who um, yeah, I mean, it just, yeah. So long story short, realized that, oh my, a lot of this was, um, was manipulation. <laughs> that, that the, they were just out there. Um, some of it was by personal choice. They had opportunities to be other places, but felt like manipulate people to get them money. And so you realize, like, oh, okay, don't be, don't be silly and be manipulating and give your money anymore. You learn and you change things. You grow older. So that compassion I, I developed was to say, oh, I can see to help this individual, but pity would give them money. Compassion would find them help to make them a better person. And some individuals don't want to be better people. It's, much, it's hard for that, for other people to accept. And that may, you may have to look at someone in your life and say, this person may not want to change or may not want to be better. And you can't force them to be. You have to accept that. Have compassion for them and be willing to help them if they choose to change their mind and their ways. But if they do choose not, do not, do not be a sucker. <laughs> With that said, I love you. You love yourself. God loves us. And that's all that matters.